Amen. Exodus chapter 3 this morning, if you will take your Bible, Exodus chapter 3, and we'll read from there in just a second. And then uh, if you want to put a marker in the book of John, we'll read from Exodus here together, and then really the, the bulk of the message will be from John this morning. But Exodus chapter 3, and the passage we're going to read here in just a second, helping lay a little bit of the foundation for it. Uh, It's talking about Moses, a story we all know very well, but specifically the verses we're going to read, verses 13 through 15 of Exodus 3, it's about his encounter with the burning bush there in the wilderness. And, you know, the Bible story, this we're reading, really takes on a whole new meaning uh, for me. We just a couple of weeks ago had the opportunity to go to uh, Branson, Missouri for a family vacation. And while there, one of the things we did is we went to uh, the Sight and Sound Theater. And it's a big 2,000 seat uh, kind of a Broadway style theater. And they uh, have one there in Branson, another one in Lancaster, uh, Pennsylvania area. And I would encourage you, if you ever get the opportunity to go, go. It is absolutely phenomenal. But we went and what the the showing that they had at that time, there's 2000 people packed out in the afternoon and it was on the story of Moses. And really just to be able to see uh, the scriptural account that I've heard and even read so many times, uh, really be able to come to life in front of my eyes was just absolutely amazing. And from that, I really went back and a couple of times reread uh, this passage of scripture and really led to the verses this morning. But laying the context of what led to Moses being there on the backside of the desert and, and talking to this burning bush, we know that you know Mos- Moses was born Born in a time when the Hebrew children were being killed by Pharaoh. Uh, He wanted all of them dead. And so many of us who have heard the story, and if not, I'll quickly kind of give you the highlights of it. But Moses was born, and when Moses was three months old, and during that three-month period, he was really hid, and almost they kept it under wraps, because if the soldiers knew that there was another Hebrew baby born, they would instantly come in and, and take his life. And so at three months, though, they knew they just wouldn't be able to keep him any longer. And so the mother wanted to give him at least a chance at life, and so she made a little basket for him and placed him there in the river. And we all know the story that he went down the river and Pharaoh's daughter, the princess, was down by the river and she heard the cry. She saw the basket and saw this little baby. And we know that Moses' sister, if you read the scripture, was kind of close by, kind of keeping an eye on it just to see what would happen. And Pharaoh's daughter found the baby and really kind of was conflicted with herself. She could tell it was a Hebrew baby. You know, what do I do with it? I know my father is the king. He wants all the Hebrew babies dead. But she really, something tugged at her heart. And so she decided to make the decision that she was just going to accept him as her son. But she wasn't in a place to really be able to take care of him. And so uh, she made that need known. And Moses' sister was close by and said, hey, I know someone that could take care of him. And so Pharaoh's daughter uh, really turned Moses back over to his mother. And what just an awesome turn of events that is in itself. And Moses' mother was able to take care of him really until he was weaned and brought him back to the palace. And we understand going through the story that Moses really lived in the palace as one of the king's sons. And really was just like one of the blood uh, and the blood uh, children to Pharaoh's uh, daughter or to anybody in his family. And so Pharaoh, uh, Moses, rather, was given all of the benefits that Pharaoh's biological children did. We know, though, that him, having grown up in that Hebrew household, he knew there was something different about him, and he knew his roots. And we know that during that time, the children of Israel were forced into slavery and were, uh, were having to make bricks out of straw and were really just a, a terrible, uh, terrible place that they were in. Well, we know, see the story that Moses was out and about and he saw one of the Egyptian soldiers were just absolutely just attacking one of the Hebrew men. And instead of saying something about it, Moses kind of lost his cool, went straight in and he actually killed that Egyptian soldier. We see later that Moses was trying to kind of uh, help the children of Israel. And we see that really two of them, two of the Hebrews, they got into a little bit of a spat. And Moses kind of tried to come in and tell them, hey, that's not the way way we should act. We're brothers in Christ. And one of them said, well, Moses, what are you going to do? You're going to kill me Uh, just like you killed that Egyptian soldier. And shortly thereafter, Moses really had to flee for his life. 
He went running trying to, uh, he basically, the Hebrews didn't want him, didn't trust him, didn't believe in him. They wanted nothing to do with him. Obviously, when it became known that he killed the Egyptian soldier, Pharaoh wanted his head as well because that was just law. You didn't do that. And so he ran trying to get away from it all. That led him there to the backside of the desert and uh, he ran across several young ladies who were sisters and they were Jethro uh, the shepherd, his daughters. And uh, the, the Bible account tells us that they were there getting water and some shepherds came through and basically they started harassing them a little bit, giving them a little bit of a hard time. And Moses kind of came to the rescue and got rid of them. And at that point, the daughters go back and tell their dad that, hey, this guy saved us. And he said, bring him unto me. And so Moses came and Moses ended up marrying one of Jethro's daughters and ended up tending to sheep there on the backside of the desert. And that really brings us up to speed with where he's at. He's tending the sheep. And that brings us uh, to Exodus chapter number three, verses 13 through 15. And probably my favorite part of this story is he's there. He hears a voice coming from a burning bush, but not just any burning bush. This was a burning bush that would not consume itself. Am I the only man out there that uh, has, has an infatuation with fire? Anybody else? It's something about men and fire. We just, we enjoy it. Uh, Pastor, it's one of his favorite things. If we're ever on vacation and we're staying at a hotel or something, his first thing is he wants to know if there's a fire pit. And he enjoys just, it's something about just watching a fire. And I enjoy fires too, except when they get out of hand or out of control. Uh, has anybody had experience where maybe a fire got a little bit out of control? And we had one of those in our house just recently. And uh, we were uh, cooking, uh, getting ready for a meal. And we decided we wanted bacon on our hamburgers. And, and so I looked up online. I said, there's got to be an easier way than bringing out, you know, the skillet or whatever you call the thing that you put the bacon in and, uh, and fry it up and get it ready. I said, we're already cook using the grill for, you know, for burgers. There's got to be a way to cook bacon on a grill. And so I looked it up and YouTube is your friend and you could find out anything on YouTube. And so I watched it and sure enough, there's, there, you can do it. You can cook bacon on a grill. And so we did it and it, the bacon was phenomenal. It was great. Cooked perfectly. Fantastic. Well, we a week later, we're needing bacon for something else. And uh, well, let's just fire up the grill and let's just, you know, put bacon. Let's cook it. And it was great. And so we did it and uh, put bacon and, you know, have a sheet and foils to kind of catch the grease and put it all in there. Well, we kind of forgot that the bacon uh, was in the barbecue grill and we're sitting there. My wife was getting something done in the kitchen. I uh, was on the couch and I can kind of see the grill and she turns and smoke just coming out either side of our grill. And I'm not just talking about uh, a little bit of smoke. It, it was a lot of smoke coming out. And before thinking anything, or, oh, we better go check it. You know, something's obviously wrong with the grill. And before thinking anything, my wife goes out there and pulls open the lid to the grill. And I am talking about eight foot high flames. And you can ask her, I'm not even exaggerating. Eight foot high flames, uh, absolutely just going flames. At that point, I kind of almost froze with fear. Like, okay, what do we do? It's going to set my house on fire. It's right under our patio and we better do something. And so my wife was jumping into action and obviously we've got bacon going, the grease, that's what's catching on fire. And she went and got the little gardening uh, thing and was going to get water and was about to pour water on that. Uh, and I don't know a whole lot about much, but I do know from some time, I think, you know, Smokey the Bear or something, I learned that you don't put water on a grease fire. And so man, I told her, no, stop, don't do that. And, and so we stopped her and we pulled it out and then we're about to start throwing dirt on it. The fire finally went out. I look over at my wife and we kind of, once we caught our breath and okay, everything's good now, I look o over at her and I see uh, uh, her hair didn't quite look the same. And, and it was a lot of little frizzy parts all in the hair. And it's true, so you can ask her. And I, I babe, uh, she's like, what? She could tell, and she starts doing this number. And being the loving husband that I am, uh, you know, I, you know, just absolutely in care and love, you know, let me pray for you. You know, let's, this is tra tra traumatic time, it's tragic. I actually think I said, you don't have any eyebrows. And she starts looking like this. And I'm just kidding. It wasn't that bad. But she sure enough singed her hair. We learned our lesson. And so I enjoy fires. And so I think that this is why that part is probably my favorite part of this story. But Moses hears, and we'll read the verses in just a second. But Moses hears from the burning bush, basically go to Pharaoh, tell him to let my people go. Well, Moses asked him, he said, well, who do I say sent me? 
And what we're going to read in the scripture is the answer that God gives him. And let's read this passage, Exodus chapter 3. Stand with me if you would, please. Exodus chapter 3, verses 13 through 15. I'll read verse 13. Let's read 14 together, and I'll close with verse 15. Exodus chapter 3, verse 13, it says this, And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you, and they shall say unto me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? Join, join with me on verse 14. And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. And God said moreover unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob hath sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. Can you kind of hear Moses there saying, all right, God, you're, you're telling me to just go into the king, tell him, hey, I'm commanding God. You remember, they're a pagan uh, culture. I'm commanding you by God's name that you let the children of Israel go. And he said, who do I tell them when they ask who you are? What do I say? And God says, tell them, I am has sent you. That's what we're going to look at this morning. Amen. Thank you for that. Cassius Marcellus Clay Jr. was born January 17, 1942. Many of us would know him as Muhammad Ali, one of the greatest fighters, uh, boxers of our generation. And he started boxing really at the age of 12, and it came from an event. Someone uh, stole his bicycle, and the police officer came, and they were trying to track down who it was. And uh, he said, if I get my hands on whoever stole my bike, I'm just going to beat him down. I'm going to take it to him. Well, this police officer by the name of Joe Martin uh, helped with the inner city youth at that time and ran a boxing club there downtown. And he said, well, if you're going to start picking fights with people, you need to learn how to box. Well, and that's exactly what Muhammad Ali did and became one of the greatest boxers that we've ever known. And he went to the Olympics and when he was still an amateur and won the gold medal by beating a Polish fighter there in Rome. And after his Olympic victory, really, he came home as a uh, American icon, an American hero, having brought home the gold medal. And he soon turned professional and began to win many fights. He first took out the British heavyweight champion Henry Cooper in 1963. And then his first, really, the world heavyweight bout was with Sonny Liston uh, there in 1964 to become the heavyweight champion of the world. One of the things that Muhammad Ali was known for was uh, just his statements that he would say. And just as much as he was known for his fighting, he was known for what he would say leading up to a fight. One of his more famously quoted descriptions, Ali told reporters that he could float like a butterfly and sting like a bee, something we've all heard plenty of times. But in 1963, he made a very kind of famous, if you're into sports and into boxing, uh, speech entitled, I am the greatest. As he went on, that was leading up to his fight with Sonny Liston, and uh, a lot of what he did was getting inside the other fighter's head. But as he went throughout this poem, he goes on to talk about how great he is as a fighter. And he goes on and on to say, I am, I am, I am the greatest. Those two words, I am, that's the name that God gave Moses when he was talking to that burning bush and he said, God, who do I tell Pharaoh sent me when I tell him to let my people go? God told him, I am. You see, throughout the Old Testament, God reveals himself often uh, to people. And it's interesting if you'll study it out, many times they ask God what his name is. And that's really a hard thing to answer because God all throughout scripture has many names. In one passage, he's El Shaddai. Another, he's Elohim and Adonai and Jehovah. Yahweh refers to God, Jehovah Shalom, Jehovah Jireh, and many others throughout Scripture. One of the interesting things to know when it comes to the names of God, they aren't just names, but they're a description of his character. They're a description of who he is. You see, God is righteous. God is the provider, God is sovereign, and God is powerful, and God is faithful, and on and on we go. So when God said to Moses, tell them I am has sent you, it was almost to tell Moses, take your pick. Hey, you take your pick, I am. I am whatever you want me to be, I am. I am God, I am all things. 
The greatness of our God cannot be found in a name or in a title. The most we can do to understand him, our closest way to comprehend him is represented by that word Yahweh, which is the God who is. He's not created. He is not finite. He is not mentally feasible. He just is. And this morning, very quickly, I want to go through John. If you would turn over in your Bibles to John, there are seven statements that God makes throughout the book of John. They're called the seven I am statements. He makes these statements just like Muhammad Ali, I am the greatest. And he did back it up as being the greatest fighter. God makes these statements, I am. And he tells us what he is. And that's what we're going to really look at this morning. Each one of these I am's represent a particular relationship. The first one we're going to look at is John chapter 6, verses 31 through 35. John chapter 6, verses 31 through 35. And each one of these I am's, as I said, represent a particular relationship of Jesus to the spiritual needs of men and women. This first I am statement came right after Jesus fed the 5,000 and it was really at the pinnacle of his popularity, so to speak, in ministry and crowds were literally following him. And uh, at this point, he wanted to get away from the crowd. He had just fed the 5,000. He wanted to get away from them and kind of get alone. And so he went across the water and the crowd heard he was there. And so they loaded up on boats and they basically tracked him down. And that brings us to John chapter 6, verse 31 through 35. I'll read it here. Our fathers did eat manna in the desert as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. I want you for just a second, think about food for a moment. For some of us, that's not difficult. Uh, That is always on our mind. Some of you, as soon as I got up here, you started figuring out if you're going to go to San Miguel or Aztecas, and if you're going to get fajitas or quesadilla, you're already thinking about lunch. But how many of you, have you ever eaten a meal where you were so stuffed and so hungry, you made a statement like, I'm never going to eat again. Uh, Anybody else like that? Just me. I'm the only glutton. Okay. All right. We got that settled. I remember we went to Gatlinburg, uh, kind of a family get together. And there was one of these uh, famous kind of uh, chefs and cooks. They had a restaurant open there and it's family style. And I remember we sat down and we decided we were going to eat at 2 o'clock. It would kind of be lunch and dinner uh, because we knew we were going to eat a lot. And they would just keep bringing the food. And we sat down and had some of the best meatloaf I had ever tasted. Boy, then they brought macaroni and cheese. And they brought these creamy garlic mashed potatoes. And then to top it all off, they had this ooey gooey butter cake is what it was called. Well, and I remember after eating that, I left there. I almost had to roll myself, I think, out of uh, the restaurant. I had eaten so much. And I remember I made a statement like, boy, I don't think I'm going to eat again for a week. You know what? That was at 2 o'clock. I think by 6 o'clock, I was already, what's, what's for dinner? What are we going to eat? I was hungry yet again. You know, that's so true of physical food. We can eat and eat and eat and eat, but it's never going to fulfill. It's never going to fill the void in our life. Just as physical food will never completely satisfy us in the long term, so many in this world are living their life in the same way. They're living a life to please themselves and they're living a life to fulfill the lusts of their own self and and they're living for me instead of living for Christ. And God says very clearly, I am the bread of life. Hey, if you eat of this bread, you'll never hunger again. You wonder why so many are out there in the world and, and they're eating, they're fulfilling, they're doing so much, but yet there's still a void in their life. They're still missing something. They're still wanting more. Can I tell you, it's because they haven't gone to the bread of life. Isaiah 55 verse 2 sums it up perfectly. Wherefore do ye spend money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which satisfieth not? Hearken diligently unto me and eat ye that which is good and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Boy, can I remind us and challenge us this morning. Let's not live a life that is wasting our time and wasting our resources on things that do not matter. Jesus tells us here that he is the spiritual food that we need. And he is the only thing that will give us fulfillment in our life. I'm sure we'd all agree in here this morning, but I wonder how many of us are taking advantage of it. How many of us are eating from that bread every morning? 
How many of us are opening God's word and we're getting into it and we're saying, God, I need that fresh bread from heaven every day as I get up and I need to get in the word of God because I need to be fed because that is the only thing that is going to fulfill my life is a relationship with Christ. I wonder how many of us are just going through the motions and, and we wonder why things aren't going like we want to. There's so many that are searching There's so many that are feeding themselves things that will not satisfy. Boy, and can I encourage you in this idea of feeding ourselves? Ask yourself this question. How many of us this morning, if we fed ourselves physically like we do spiritually, how many of us would still be alive today? So many of us as Christians, our whole spiritual feeding that we get is Sunday morning. Boy, and I'm glad I'm speaking to the choir. You're here this morning. But maybe there's some of you that you even go to Sunday night. But then it's nothing until Wednesday and then till the next Sunday. Can I say if we fed ourselves physically that way, it would cause a lot of health problems. We wouldn't be around very long. And God is saying, I am the bread of life. And if you eat from this bread, you'll never hunger again. And what he's trying to get us to see is, hey, Jesus Christ, our relationship with him, it's the only thing that's going to fulfill us in this life. The first I am statement, I am the bread of life. Look at John chapter 8 and verse number 12. And we see the second I am statement. The second, and really these last couple I'm just going to give to you. The second I am statement, I am the light of the world. John 8 verse 12, then spake Jesus again unto them saying, I am the light of the world. And he that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Boy, Jesus is the light of this world as he said. Doesn't it seem that this world just seems to be getting darker and darker each and every day? Brother Nick Coates, I still remember preached a tremendous message on this subject a year or so ago. And I'd encourage you to go back online and look at it. But John chapter 3, verse 19 and 20 really says a lot about the state of our world. It says, and this is the condemnation that light has come into the world. And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light. Neither cometh to the light lest his deeds should be reproved. Boy, it seems that every day Christianity is getting attacked. Boy, we hear almost daily on the news of Christian brothers and sisters around the globe who are literally getting beheaded for their faith. Christian businesses are getting attacked and sued because they are standing for their beliefs. Murders seem to be happening more and more. Mass shootings, terrorism, hatred and idolatry and demonic influence seems to be more and more prevalent. Boy, if we aren't careful, we'll think that there's not a whole lot of hope for this dark world. But as Jesus says very clearly right there, I am the light of this world. The only hope is in Jesus Christ. Can I tell us this morning that our hope for Mobile isn't going to be in the upcoming mayor's election. It's going to be found in the light, which is Jesus Christ. Our hope for our state isn't found in who is in the governor's mansion at this point in time and whether or not whether or not that may change next week or the week after as it has so many times recently that is not where our hope is found it's found in the light of Jesus Christ it's not found in the Senate it's not going to be found in Congress and dare I even say it is not going to be found in our President of the United States the only hope that this nation has to dispel the darkness is the light of Jesus Christ now how do we get that light out there Matthew 5, 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Boy, as Christians, can I challenge us this morning? Let's stop sitting back and saying, oh, this world is so dark. There's so many problems out there. Boy, we're getting persecuted. Let's stand up. Let's get up. Let's do something about it. Boy, let's let people see our light shine for Jesus Christ. And let's impart that light upon someone else and tell somebody about the gospel. Boy, when I was a youth pastor, I used to tell the teenagers, Hey, I wonder if I went to your school and I was to ask those around you, did you know so-and-so went to this church and was a Christian? Would they even have an idea of it? I told them I feel like there's this, there's a CIA portion of Christianity that they're undercover spies. We know, what the, we know they're a Christian because they come to church, but boy, outside of it, nobody else would know. Do you know as I have went on from being the youth pastor, now working with adults and in, in adult Sunday school classes, Can I say it's no different with adults? I wonder how many of you men, ladies, if I was to come to your place of work and I was to say, hey, did you know sister so-and-so goes to our church and she's a Christian? 
Would they be shocked by that? Would they have any idea? Are you letting your light shine? Number three this morning, and I'm quickly going through because of time. Turn to John chapter 10. John chapter 10, verses 7 through 10. And I'll read it if, uh, for sake of time. But the third I am statement, I am the door. Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Jesus is telling us here that he is the only entrance into heaven. Boy, if you're here this morning and you're not sure of your salvation, I'm pleading with you and begging you to not leave this building this morning until you get it nailed down. But can I tell you, if you're trusting in anything else except for the blood of Jesus Christ and Him dying on the cross to save you from your sins, you are sorely mistaken. Jesus says, I am the door, the only door, the only entrance. There are no side doors into heaven. There are no back doors. There are no other doors but walking through that door of Jesus Christ, which is accepting His salvation. Acts 4.12 says this, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby ye must be saved boy if you're trusting in anything that you've done you're sorely mistaken the only way into heaven is through that door Ephesians 2 8 9 for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God not of works lest any man should boast I don't care how good you think you are this morning I don't care how much good that you have done in your life Jesus says I am the door the fourth I am is found really in the next couple of verses. John chapter 10, verses 11 through 14. God says, I am the good shepherd. He says in verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd uh, giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is an hireling and not the shepherd whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth. And the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. The hiring fleeth because he is an hireling and careth not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. You see, a shepherd leads, feeds, and protects his flock. And that is exactly what God wants to do for us. A good shepherd is willing to die for his sheep. And so did Christ, the good shepherd in John, the great shepherd in Hebrews, and the chief shepherd in Peter was willing to and did die for his sheep. Luke chapter 15, verses 12 through 14 is such a tremendous picture of the good shepherd and his love for us. It says, how think ye if a man have an hundred sheep and one of them be gone astray? Doth he not leave the ninety and nine and goeth into the mountains and seeketh that which is gone astray? And if so, be that he find it. Verily I say unto you, he rejoiceth more of that sheep than of the ninety and nine which went not astray. Even so is it not the will of your Father which is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. What's amazing to think about is the good shepherd knows every single one of his sheep and he cares for every single one of them individually. Well, you may be here this morning and you may think that you, no one cares what you're going through. Nobody knows how tough I have it right now. Boy, my marriage isn't what it needs to be. My relationship with my children seems to be falling apart. God has brought this onto my life and this, and I'm being attacked from every side. And you can almost, if you're not careful, tell yourself that nobody cares. But can I tell you, the good shepherd is right there, and he is looking out for you. Jesus Christ, who knows every sparrow that falls, he knows every hair that is on your head. He knows exactly what you're going through. And he says, I am the good shepherd. I am there for you you number five and number six we won't take the time to read those but number five the fifth I am statement is I am the resurrection and life John eleven twenty five 25 and 26 and I'll really just read the verse that Jesus said unto her I am the resurrection and the life he that believeth in me though he were though he were dead yet shall he live and whoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die believest thou this number six I am the way the truth and the life John 14 6 Jesus saith unto him I am the way the truth and the life no man cometh unto the father but by me. Again, pounding home that thought that there is no salvation except through Jesus Christ. The last I am statement as we close this morning I am the true vine. John chapter 15 and verses 1 through 5 is where he makes this last I am statement. He says, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. 
Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. Except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. Boy, this passage is such a sobering uh, thought for these couple of verses. He reminds us that without the power of Christ, without abiding in a relationship with him, without being connected to that true vine, we can do nothing. Boy, how many times have we been guilty as Christians of going through the motions? How many times maybe have we gotten up even as a Sunday school teacher or maybe as, as a singer and we get up and sing and we do not do it with the power of God on our lives. Jesus says here that if you are not connected to that true vine, if you are not abiding in Christ, you will fail at everything you're doing. You will not be able to make it. May we be a church that is doing all we can to reach people with the gospel while we can. Boy, may we be a church that is passionate about having the hand of God on this place as I believe it is. May we have Sunday school teachers and bus workers and, and children's workers and nursery workers that they are passionate about abiding in a true relationship with Christ and having the power of God on their life. You see, God says if a branch isn't bringing forth fruit, he'll purge it. Boy, what a sobering reminder that is for us as Christians. Having the hand of God on our life, having the blessings where that fruit is coming isn't guaranteed. And the Bible says that if we are not abiding in Him and in turn we're not bringing forth fruit, God may just cut that branch completely off. Boy, that power, that blessing... That true relationship with God, just having, how many of you have ever been there where you just, your, your prayer life is just so sweet? Boy, everything, you do, every time you come to church, God just seems to be speaking with you and you're abiding in Him. Can I say also when it comes to purging and pruning, which is what that purging means, sometimes it's cutting it back so it could bring forth more fruit. The pruning process, they go in and they'll cut off some of the small branches that are sucking most of the nutrients from these fruit producing branches. There may be some this morning that God seems to be pruning and God seems to be purging some things in your life and you don't understand why. Can I say the very reason may be so when you come down a month or two from now and God has finished His work in you, God has finished pruning you, God has finished purging the things that you've allowed to come into your life that you are able to bring forth more fruit. What a tremendous thought. I am. I am. Moses says, God, when you send me to the children of Israel or to Pharaoh to tell them to let your people go, who do I say sent me? God says, tell them I am. And then in John, he gives us seven statements telling them who he is. I am the bread of life. I am the good shepherd. I am the true vine. I am.